Very good. And if you have questions, please write them down. We're going to get to all the questions at the end, but Jeff, take it away. All right, gang, I'm going to going to start out by uh, telling you that I literally hate giving presentations like this to a live audience over Zoom. It's one of my least favorite things on the planet to do. I'm happy to be here with you this morning, however, because um, we are living in a time that is, quite frankly, unprecedented. And I've been talking about this for quite some time. When I think about um, my first presentation that I gave on artificial intelligence to a real estate group was to the Arizona Association of Realtors on December 7th, 2016. I talked about the value of being human in an artificial intelligence driven world. And as you can imagine, uh, in 2016, that may have fallen on more than just a few deaf ears. And I guess I'm not surprised. One of the questions I asked in that presentation is, how will clients distinguish you from an AI-driven chatbot? Now, I, I want you to think back to 2016 and what was available. Wasn't hard to distinguish yourself from an AI-driven chatbot in 2016. Even today, if I ask Alexa to do something for me, the vast majority of the time, what it comes back with is is complete crap, quite frankly. Um, most of the time I'm using Alexa just to set a timer for what it is that I'm cooking. So the, the, the reality though is what you're seeing today has been in the works for more than 50 years. The algorithms, the math, this is all just math. It's really complex math, but it's just math. The math involved in artificial intelligence has been being theorized for as long as there have been computer chips. And so this experience that we have was really transformed wow, less than six months after that initial presentation I gave. Uh, the, the concept of a transformer was invented by the Google Brain team in August of 2017. And quite frankly, those 200 lines of code have changed the world. Everything you're seeing today, everything that you see happening with ChatGPT, which is, which is the program that probably woke you up to artificial intelligence, is driven by the concept of transformers. And we're not going to go into transformers today. It's not important. What's important to understand is we're talking about developments that are very new in the field of artificial intelligence and have been developing rapidly ever since. So what ended up happening here is, in May of 2018, you may remember this demonstration. Uh, it used to be that I would look so forward to Google's I.O. conference every May because Google was the only company that was really coming out with big announcements on artificial intelligence. And they always use their I.O. showcase as a way to sort of um, blow people's minds with what was possible. And in May of 2018, they, they showcased something called Google Duplex. And if you remember, they had the computer call a hair salon and make an appointment on behalf of its owner. It, it acted as a true virtual assistant in that it, it dialed a phone, it spoke to a human, it organized the meeting, it made the appointment and put it into the human's calendar. And then everything sort of went silent. You didn't hear anything about it. They put it out into the wild, but it, it sat in the background. And so in June of that same year, GPT-1 was released by OpenAI. And quite frankly, it was released without a whole lot of fanfare, even though it was a pretty impressive piece of code. In February of 2019, after OpenAI basically uh, put out a press release that said that GPT-2 was too dangerous to release into the wild. They released it into the wild. And then in May of 2020, they released GPT-3. And I remember the first presentation that I gave after the release of GPT-3, the writing that it did was so good, I described it as scary. And so we sit here today in an entirely new age. On November 29, 2022, you went to sleep 
and none of what you're seeing today, uh, it was all seen as some future reality. And then on November 30th, 2022, ChatGPT changed everything. When I say it changed everything, I mean, it woke up the world to this notion that artificial intelligence could do things that we had only previously imagined. We talked about Iron Man and Jarvis and the ability to have a conversation with the computer. I, I'm not certain you can overstate the impact of the change in the way that you can now interface with your computer. And so this is where we sit. Uh, Bill Gates wrote a, a, a paper a couple of months ago in which he said, that this was the most important advance in computer technology since the graphical user interface. And I remember that launch. Um, I got my start in technology in 1984. I started my first company in 1985. In 1984, that commercial where the hammer is thrown into the screen that launched the Mac computer, that was, that was the launch of the graphical user interface to the mainstream world. And the ability to click on icons and to use a mouse to operate around the computer shifted how we used computers, shifted our ability to interface with them in ways that were meaningful and more human. And in the same way, ChatGPT does that only on steroids, on, on another level, what, what we're going to be seeing from this moment forward is a completely different way of using computers. And I'm not certain that any of us are fully ready for the transformations that are going to happen. Part of my presentation here today is designed to make certain that you are at the same time scared to death and excited. Because while I still believe this, that AI won't take your job, a competitor using AI will, I don't believe that that's true any longer if you're mediocre or you're overpaid. I, I honestly believe that for the vast majority of tasks that take place inside of most jobs, AI will do a better job than the average human. And so, I woke up to this on uh, May 6, 2023. It was the first real instance that I can remember of someone losing their job to chat GPT. This was a technical writer whose clients basically said, listen, we know that you're better than chat GPT. But at the price that we pay for ChatGPT, it doesn't make sense for us to continue using you. That was an existential moment. And it should be a wake up call to just about everyone because this is, this is what we know to be true. And, and I think if you, if you really search inside of yourself, you'll admit this as well. When, when something costs almost nothing, it doesn't have to be better than the best. It just has to be good enough. And that's where we sit. And so I want to show you a few things today just to sort of help you uh, understand where I, I think all of this is going. And, and none of this is going to shock you. Um, you, sh you should be prepared for some of this already. Uh, Chatpds.com. I, I want you to imagine a world in which I simply upload any contract, and so let's go do that. By the way, this year already, May 2023, June 2023, there have been 26 major releases of large language models, some of which you've never heard of. The, the pace at which this is advancing, often with the help of the technology that's advancing it, is, I, I, I don't, actually, I don't even know how to describe it. And so, what we're going to be seeing very, very soon is what I'm going to call um, highly specific domain adaptation. And so in this case, all I'm doing is I'm going to upload a PDF. I'm going to upload a Tangela contract. I'm going to do it from my hard drive live. I'm always hesitant about these kinds of demos, but I'm going to do it anyway. So 
in in this moment, it has completely analyzed that entire contract. And so I'm just going to ask it a question. Who owns my data? And it's going to give me an answer. According to two, the company owns all of this. It's giving me the response. How can I terminate this contract? Either party may terminate the agreement immediately by giving written notice where the other part, and it's basically going and finding all these things. I could sit and have a conversation. All right, this isn't trained as an attorney. I want you to imagine for a second that another company takes a similar technology and marries it with everything you know about state real estate law in the state of New York and marries that with the ability to analyze a contract. Is there anything in this contract that I should be concerned with relative to fill in the blank? Please explain clause seven to me. Um, what's my liability in clause nine? How do I just fill in the blank? All of this is knowable. And where something is knowable, where there's data that it can be trained on, ChatGPT is already past the bar. So it already has some knowledge. But when you get to domain adaptation, where domain specific knowledge is fed in and the source of truth becomes that, you get a very powerful engine for understanding pretty much anything you need to understand. So this is doable today. What's not yet there, and I expect that within the next two or three months, you're going to see some very specific legal applications that are going to be developed in this area, is an intelligent agent that's going to help you understand contracts in a way that is uh, uh, pretty, pretty amazing. That's the first thing I want to point out. Second thing is the Bill Gates was caught off guard by this calling it again, the, the second most, the most important thing that he's seen since the graphical user interface. And part of it is when we talk to the computer, we begin to say more, we begin to share more. If I'm searching around on Zillow, for example, and I put in an area that I'm looking to search for homes for, it's gonna return results. I'm gonna click a button. I'm gonna look at some photographs. I may go back and change my search. I can learn a lot from if I'm if I'm Zillow, but not as much as I can learn if I also give it a conversational engine that allows me to talk to it. If now I'm talking to my computer and I'm saying, find me a house in this area. I, I, I like this area because, and I fill in the blank and it goes out and finds some houses and I look at a few of them and now I say to it, you know, this was great, but what I'm really looking for, and I go into further detail about it, I'm now sharing things in a way that because of the conversational nature will cause me to share more, just the nature of the beast. And we're going to have a system, conversational AI, friendly chatbots, if you will, that are gonna sound very, very, very human and very relatable. I'm going to give you an example of one. Uh, if you go to heypie.com, you can check this out for yourself. I'm going to choose uh, a voice. I can choose any voice I want. I'll okay, I'm ready button. to hit the reset button. Let's. Okay, I'm ready to hit the reset button. Let's start with introductions. I'm Pi, a personal AI designed to be friendly, useful, and informative. I'm here to listen and talk about whatever you'd like. What's your name? My name's Jeff. Um, I assume I can just call you Pi, or should I call you something else? You can definitely call me Pi. It's short for personal intelligence. I'm not too fussy about names. Well, then let's talk a little bit about real estate. Talk to me. How, how can I find a good real estate agent?
Well, first off, it's important to find an agent who is knowledgeable and experienced in your area of interest. It's also helpful to find an agent who is willing to put in the extra effort to help you find the right property. Finally, it's important to find an agent who you feel comfortable with and who you feel you can trust. Do you have any additional questions or concerns about finding a real estate agent? No, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. So I, I could go on with this conversation. I could talk about things personal. I could uh, tell it that I'm not very motivated today and I'm, I need a way to get myself out of bed and, and start my day off and it would sit and have a conversation with me. Its speed will improve as computer technology improves and the latency that you're hearing going back and forth will ultimately disappear. And what I want you to think about is when that happens, how will you distinguish yourself from an AI chatbot? How will you be better than an AI chatbot? How will you be as present? How will you be as informed? How will you be fill in the blank? This is the place where we find ourselves. And so Siri and Alexa continue to frustrate. Um, that's a fact. I, I, I think both Amazon and Apple were caught off guard by OpenAI's announcement in ChatGPT. They'll catch up. They, they have amazing teams, and, and certainly they will. But in the meantime, if you want to have a different conversation, I'm not going to demo this today, go search on your iPhone for the Lori app and install it and enable it. The other day in the car, I, to get to it, all I have to do is say, hey, Siri, say hi to Lori. And, and it's trying to on my screen right now. It is not hooked up to my Mac. All I have to do is say that, and it goes and gets the Lori app, and I can have a conversation with it in the same way that I had a conversation with Hey Pi. The difference is the latency is better. I had a full conversation in my car the other day about a concept that I heard in the podcast. I didn't know a lot about the concept, and so I simply asked it, explain this concept to me. And I went back and forth with the Lori app, asking it questions, getting more in depth. It was as if somebody was sitting in the car with me, fully knowledgeable, having the conversation. That's where we're at today. This is what the consumer is going to be used to. This is, this is what we've been trained, trained to accept. We spent the last 15 years engaging with social media, um, going hmm. back and forth. It looks like effects. you haven't set up iMessage yet. Again, Siri continues to disappoint. We're trained to have these interactions with the computer. We're trained, even if voice to text didn't exist, even, even if I couldn't talk to it like a human, if I've got a good enough chatbot, and we're seeing that happen today with Instagram and Snapchat, if I've got a good enough AI chatbot, I will sit and have conversations with it. Millions are having conversations with these AI chatbots today. And all the while, those millions of people are training those chatbots. So the next thing I'm going to show you, I'm just going to show it to you briefly because I want you to see where this technology is heading. It's not just going to be voice. It's, it's going to be fake humans who you're going to sit and have these conversations with. Good to see you again. How is it going? It's going well. I actually um, want to ask you for a little bit of advice, if you don't mind. Of course. I'm always here to help. What's on your mind? Well, I'm doing a presentation on artificial intelligence uh, as it relates to real estate technology to uh, a policy committee to help them understand what you know policies might need to be put in place to protect the consumer, and I'm uh, wondering if you had any advice for me. That sounds like an interesting topic. I would definitely recommend starting with the basics of AI and how it's being used in real estate technology. You could then go on to discuss the potential benefits and risks of using AI in this field, such as improved accuracy and property valuations, but also concerns about bias and privacy. So. 
I'm in agreement with Bill Gates. It's the most important advance in computer technology since the graphical user interface. And it's not just because of our ability to sit and have a conversation with it as if I'm having a conversation with you right now. It changes, it changes the nature of the kinds of things that we can do. I Photoshop just released in this last week the ability to use generative fill inside of an image. And quite frankly, it, it's a mind-blowing thing. And I'm just going to show this to you real quick here. Just so that you can get a, a feel for it. This is available in the beta version of Photoshop if you have access to it. I'm just going to drop this down here. Get this out of my way. Walk you through it real quick. This won't take long. I'm not even going to have to give it a command. It understands this image. I'm going to use generative fill. I'm going to hit generate. And it's basically going to fill in this missing part of the image. It's good to imagine what was missing. Um, these are the kinds of skills that a trained Photoshop expert, it would, it would take hours and hours and hours for a human to do. Literally hours and hours and hours. And in a matter of seconds, I'm going to have three different variations on what this fill looks like. Now, that's impressive. It's, it's imaginative. It's fantastical. The original image was created in mid-journey via a prompt. So everything you're seeing here is completely made up, obviously. The goal, though, is for this to become something useful. And in order to do that, we're going to have to, as a, a real estate industry, allow our data to be utilized by these systems in ways that might make us feel uncomfortable. And we're going to have to strike a balance between data privacy and data sharing. If we're going to take advantage of all of the benefits, we're going to have to assume some of the risk. There is just a treasure trove of high value data that's exclusive to this real estate space. And if we wanna to get to things, like what I'm about to show you, and I'm gonna conclude with showing you that we're gonna to have to set higher standards for artificial intelligence than we do for humans. We're gonna to have to be better in the AI world than we've been as humans. I'm not even talking about deep fakes. I'm not even talking about the political turmoil that can come from everything um, that you can see in terms of, of creating content that will completely fool the mass public. I'm talking about getting to the benefits that the consumer might want in the real estate industry itself. So I've been consulting with uh, a company in Bangalore, India for the last three years. And uh, two and a half years ago, I gave them the challenge, create a talking house. I want somebody to pull up to a house. I want them to scan a QR code in the front of that house and just have a chat. In the same way that I was having a chat with that PDF, I want to ask a question of the house. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I am a 1950s craftsman. I was built in this year. I was designed by this architect. Tell me a little about your roof. My roof was replaced. It's doable. It's doable today. And the concept of democratizing design, which was their original intent. So what I want you to see is a site that in the last 100 days has attracted close to a million users. A million people have signed up to use reimaginehome.ai, powered by a company called StyleDot. And what it does is truly democratize design. It creates virtual staging in furnished rooms instantly. Okay, here's a quick demo. I'm uploading a photo that I found of a home in Santa Clarita, California, where I live. It's analyzing that space. It's using a concept called semantic segmentation to not just identify the objects in the room, but to mask those objects. And what we're gonna do now is simply paint the wall. We're gonna paint it a warm gray and export another image. It goes through and does that. I now have this home. I, I guarantee you, you've cruised through looking for a house, uh, not liking the paint on the walls, but having a difficult time imagining it. Reimaginehome.ai is uh, a company that uh, Venture MLS invested about a million dollars in with the goal of bringing AI to the real estate industry in new and creative ways. And this is one of the ways that is only possible with the data that's available inside of the MLS and framed specifically 
to generate unique, amazing experience for the consumer. If I'm searching for a house and I'm having a hard time understanding how this might look in a style that's more appropriate to me, this is the kind of stuff that we want to see happen. In order to enable it, we're going to have to get very, very comfortable with sharing our data. And we're going to have to get very, very comfortable with it being trained to replace us. So I'm going to leave you uh, it, it, with the same encouragement that I left the audience in Arizona in 2016 with this comment. In a world of increasing automation, people who can genuinely connect with others are going to be more valuable at less. Stay focused on the things that make you uniquely human and don't be afraid of the change that's coming because it's coming and it's coming whether you like it or not. Morning, well, good morning, everyone. So I am Carrie Little. I am here in West Chicago, Illinois. Now, unlike Jeff, I'm the person that when the pandemic happened, I was like, yes, we're going to shut down, totally shut down. I'm going to get a break and I'm going to get to work from home. In Illinois, we didn't shut down. So I was a little envious of New York because I thought, what a great <laughs> opportunity to catch up. So anyway, but I do like to come in person. I do like to come in person. I just got off of a plane yesterday from Putacana, and I thought I was going to be able to fly right in to see all of you in person. That didn't happen, but that is okay. I am going to, so I'll share my screen with you, and I'm going to give you what I call the fun stuff or the fun part of using artificial intelligence. And I come from technology, meaning my first experience with tech was in 1990. Now, when I say 1990, I happen to be an identical twin. And when I was in high school, I was going, when I was in high school, I actually learned how to sew. I, could, I made like eight or nine prom dresses when I was in high school and I couldn't type. But in 1990, my identical twin sister worked for a company called Kassane Business Systems, and I got hired based on her skills. So that is how I got into tech. I worked for a tech company, and then I ended up editing television for a living. And so here I am. And I'll tell you, you know, my experience with AI, you know, of course, is a little bit different. I am the person that jumps right in. I am the person that learns tech a little bit differently. I, I love the technology, but I also like to make it simple. So for all of you, I thought I would ma make it a little more consumable so I can make you start using it today. So here we go. AI and real estate and the easiest way or ways to start using artificial intelligence today. And, you know, if I was in the room with all of you, I would ask the question, and some of you are probably like, well, Carrie. Um, you can't see me, you can't hear me, although it would be kind of cool if I could hear you and see you. So when I say, you know, artificial intelligence and what do you want out of it? Do you want it to help you work smarter? Now, clearly there were at least two things I learned from Jeff today um, that I'm gonna go do some more research on. So for me, it was, I needed to work smarter. In um, high school, I loved PE. I loved swimming because like only two of us in the class could swim. So I was going to get a break. I love being able to use my hands and even writing today. If you see a typo, I'm going to own it. That's the power of using artificial intelligence because it helps me work smarter. So for you, even if you're taking notes, what do you want out of artificial intelligence? Some of you are going to say, you know what? I'm still trying to upgrade my smartphone. Some of you are going to say, Carrie, I am just trying to figure out how to explain data. Some of you might even say, you just want to simplify your business. And the, there is truth in, you know, getting some help. And for me, it's lead generation. I'm sure if I were to say to all of you, how many of you, look here, I just need a paycheck. We know we've got a little under 100, 1.6 1, 1. million realtors in our state alone. 
um, or I should say in our multiple listing service in Illinois, we have 51,000 realtor members in our MLS, we have 45,000. And in August of 2014, in August, we had a little over 82,000 properties on the market. And in March of 2023, we had like 22,000. And how many ages did I say we have? 45,000 in our multiple listing service. So most of us are just trying to figure out how to lead generate. Maybe it's you just want to create content for social media. For me, I'm going to make your head spin, maybe. How about just explaining real estate data? Remember I said I love PE in high school. I learned how to sew. I was the person actually altering the teacher's clothes in high school. And I hated math. Um, I hated English. And I say I hate it because my brain didn't work like everyone else's. If I wasn't actively engaged or using my hands, it was harder for me to learn. So if I can explain real estate data, all of you can, but with using artificial intelligence, you'll be able to do it in a whole lot faster. And here's the truth when we talk about artificial intelligence. And I think, and you, first of all, you just got the tip of the iceberg. Or, you know, even when we talk about palm trees, most of us don't even know how deep a palm tree's roots go. So whatever you can think of, you can do it with artificial intelligence. And I'm going to tell you, for me, you know, a lot of this value is, you know, we can have virtual assistants, we can work faster, we can work smarter. And I would say, I'm the person that my idea of a virtual assistant is I just want someone to read my email. I want someone to read my email and then send me an email that says, here's what I need you to focus on today. And then I want the virtual assistant to get rid of all of the junk. Because you know, some of you know, you've got Nordstrom, Nordstrom Racks, TJ Maxx, you've got Bandolier, you've got all these emails coming into your inbox and you don't want to read them until you're ready, but you need to get to the meat of it. So if you're taking notes, you know, how are you currently using artificial intelligence? Some of you are like, you know what, I just need to know how to log in. I get it. I get it. So let me tell you, I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you how I'm already using it. There's so much more that I'm doing, but I'm going to give you the simple things that, that we're doing now. So I am, I've been in the real estate, you know, I've been in the business since 1997. I worked for a builder first. I got licensed in 2001. I've worked in commercial real estate. Yeah, I'm older than all of you think, five kids, three grandkids. And even my youngest, who um, I have Photoshopped really, you know, the Adobe products for him. He's got over 220,000 followers on TikTok and he is using artificial intelligence and he's a gamer. So when I ask you, how are you using it? You just might be saying, Carrie, just give me the login but you might even be just be using it to ask questions. And I recently used it when we went to the Dominican. I said, where are the people from Dominican from? I just simply asked a question to have a conversation. So even for this presentation, I used it to create images for the presentation. You're probably like, well, Carrie, that's way out of my league, but it kind of gives you an idea of how you could use it. So this is not me, but it's me. So I use a tool called um, MidJourney. So you, you have MidJourney and Discord. And I uploaded my own image. And I said, I need an image of someone that works in New York. And you have to be very specific. There's something to be said about even artificial intelligence. So I was very specific to get someone that was brown and someone that worked in New York in a coffee shop selling real estate. And this is what I got, but based on my own image. So I'm already using it to build graphics. I'm using it to write letters to my neighbors. Easy, simple, but it's converting. I'm also using it to create social media content. I'm the person that goes live every Friday at 9 a.m. on Instagram, and I can have up to 100 followers. And I am still that person like Jeff that I believe there's still value in understanding artificial intelligence. I still write my own content. I still write my own content but I get help from using artificial intelligence. My favorite, I said I have an identical twin. If you ever get to meet my husband, Mark, my husband, Mark, is the ultimate hustler. We can talk about that another day. Uh, my twin was in town because we were doing a talk on diversity and AI was included. And my husband said, oh, I got to finish this scope of work for the city of Bellwood, Illinois, 
And he was like, Carrie, can you do it? He, I, I literally have become an assistant. And again, I own my own brokerage. We have uh, around 30 real estate agents and I just don't have time to be his assistant. So my sister says, sit down, Mark. We're gonna have ChatGPT create your scope of work. So for those of you that have, that you're, you renovate properties or you flip or you're deciding to become a developer because we're in, in a developer's course with C Clay Corporation um, in the city of Chicago, we are using it to help us think. You heard Jeff say that, uh, you know, you could use it to help it explain a contract. How about thinking about how you can use it to be an investor or working with your investors or using it to create a scope of work? so you can get the work done faster. And it built the scope of work probably in less than 60 seconds. Did we make edits? Yes. Processes for my office. Again, I come from tech. And even though I come from technology, I, again, I can, you know, we use tools like uh, Meta workspace, Workplace. Um, I am very tech savvy. If you work for me and you, you don't sell a house, it's your fault. You, it's your fault because I have every video you can think of. I can show you how to convert leads, but I can also use it to create processes for new real estate agents based on how they think, because not everyone's going to pick up the phone and cold call. You know who you are. It's painful for me. Not everyone's going to do direct mail. Not everyone's going to do social media, but some of us are going to actually get up, get dressed and go outside and network. So you can create processes for your business, for your office. You could create systems. Now, when I started using uh, ChatGPT, I thought, you know, I need to test, I need to play. So I used it to create a market analysis with one of my one of our properties that we rent out. And then I went back to the multiple listing service and grabbed the data based on my townhouse. It's never been listed. Um, I'm the first owner. And I just wanted to see how the data was compared. And then I asked ChatGPT, I said, where did you get the data from? And when I say I asked, we, call, we might call them prompts. So I'm going to say, you might ask a question, you might give it a statement, you might tell it what to do. So I wanted to know where it was getting the data from. And ChatGPT said, I do not have access to the multiple listing service. I pulled the data from here, 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 and here. Public records from your competition, right? So I wanted to know what was currently available. And I go with always the what if. If I could create a market analysis and what was the difference? The data was so close, even though we know public records might not be as updated as real time in the multiple listing service, you could be, this is where the consumer might say, I just want to self-represent. We're already having the challenges with explaining exclusive agency and how we got paid, how we get paid. The consumer can just go and create their own market analysis and then they might know they'll know what to write. Or how about the consumer saying, uh, how do I write an offer without a contract on this property? Create a market analysis on this property based on this data six months back. So not only do you need to know how to use it, you need to know how, how to use it so you can explain it to the consumer and, and you best believe that the next generation is faster than us. My twin sister comes from education. She's also in California and she has gone to kids when she no longer is a principal, but she had a five-year-old, five-year-old that was doing something he or she, um, or they shouldn't have been doing. And, the, and, and so my sister said, we need to call your parents. And the child said, just give me a second. And the child called the parent from their smart watch. The next generation is faster. They're quicker. You, we can get licensed in many states at the age of 18. And some of these kids aren't going to college. My youngest who just turned 21 on Thursday, he is so much faster than I am. Just imagine if you don't figure this out. How about proofreading? I'm working on writing a book. Yes, I am writing the book. Remember I said I hated English class, 101, 102, hated it in college. I can use it to have ChatGPT rewrite in my own voice and put it in a logical format so it's, so it's consumable for the consumer or the public. How about predictive analytics? My master's degree is digital marketing and analytics. We have tools like Remind, we have tools like Realist, we have tools like InfoSparks, we have our multiple listing service. And if you don't think 
uh, first of all, you got Fannie and Freddie, you've got the banks, you've got your sponsors. They're already using predictive analytics. You can use artificial intelligence to help you figure out what's going to happen in the future. And I've already been using my multiple listing service and the data to figure out what will happen if there's no, no other variables like a pandemic. What is the market going to look like? So predictive analytics. How about lead generation? My favorite. This is how we're using it today in our office. So before I even end, because I'm going to actually log into ChatGPT, I'm going to show you three things that I am doing now to make it easy. Because some of you just need it, need it to be consumable so you can start taking action today. So number one, you can create marketing to help convert, convert uh, sellers. And I'm going to say sellers because we know inventory is so low right now. And I am, I'm data, data, data. I am so data driven. And if I can explain data to a, a seller, especially a seller that doesn't live in the property, maybe the property's paid off, it is easier for me to convert. So here is a, an example of a prompt I created using InfoSparks. So I'm using, so this is Arlington Heights, Illinois, and I built this. So um, I copy, cut, and pasted the data for Arlington Heights. And I, and, and by the way, I read typo, chat GPT reads typo. And I said, write an article for my newsletter in Arlington Heights, Illinois, using the data from April, 2023 and April, 2022. Now I, there is going to be an error, but that's okay. Um, it didn't give me the actual numbers. And I also asked it to write it down to a fifth grade level. Some of us might need it at a third grade level. That would be me. The benefit of this is, especially if you have, you have a team and you're trying to train new agents in your office or on your team, or you now are, you know, maybe you have that seller that just doesn't understand the market and you're trying to figure out how to explain it. You can use this as a way to create bullet points. So when you go into the listing presentation or you're on Zoom or WebEx or whatever you're using, you can explain the data at a fifth grade level. Now, my husband is working on a renovation in Bellwood, Illinois. And while he's there, the neighbors like to come and talk to him. And, I, and one neighbor said, you should mail to the neighbors because half the people here have lived here forever. So I, now when I tell you simple, this was in Canva. And when I say this is so basic, I literally pulled April 2023 data and April 2013 data. And I asked ChatGPT to just create um, a letter to a seller. And then I, I wrote, it's probably not the best. I actually wrote that, you know, Mark is the owner of this property. He's in the process of rehabbing. And if you're thinking of selling, I'm, I might be interested. If your home is already in great condition, you might be able to command a higher price, uh, price if we place the home on the market. For a complimentary market analysis, go to my landing page. This simple. Do you think we've generated a lead? Yes, we have. And I know all of you are like, yes, you're clapping with me. So this is the basics of how you can start using it today. Now, the other thing you can think of, you, you could probably do is how about creating social media content in minutes? Now, this is one of my favorites. I use ChatGPT and I asked ChatGPT to write nine posts for social media targeting people that rent. And I asked it to create it in a table view and it wrote nine posts for me. When it, uh, and so when it wrote those nine posts, I then had it create content for me in this thing called Canva. Okay, it's thinking, I hope I didn't get kicked off. And so it, I created the same nine posts using an app in Canva called Bulk Create. And I, I built this in a table view using Google Sheets. And you can see that's all of my content in less than five minutes. I created nine posts for Instagram Reels, for TikTok, for YouTube Shorts. You could put it on Pinterest. You could put it on Facebook Reels. Wherever you can create short video, it's already done. It's already done. There's absolutely no reason why you can't build this. You become the assistant. Or if you have a team, find the tech savvy person. You could also use it to create scripts for short video on multiple platforms. Now, again, 
usually when I work with the agents in the office or when I'm um, training agents in person or we're doing hands-on, the hardest part for many is to get what's in here into a consumable format. So the, when, when, when we started using ChatGPT or even Canva, right? Now, we, there's even something called perplexity.ai that you could start using today. I built this, I, I asked ChatGPT to write nine scripts to create short videos on Instagram. And I also asked it to create it in a column view. I asked it to give me um, two to four hashtags. And then I just clicked enter or that little green arrow. And it started creating content for me in seconds. Some of you don't even want to be seen on video. You don't have to be seen on video. You could just be the voiceover and you can create content in seconds. You just need to know what to ask. And if you don't know what to ask, the value is you just ask it again. You just, you just edit what you wrote. And there are times when I have created this and I'm like, oh, this is not giving me what I want. So I'll pause, I'll rewrite it and it will give me exactly what I want. So for those of you that are like, well, Carrie, oh, it'd be great to see an entire video. The video that I created to build these, uh, these slides is absolutely awful, but I'm still going to give it to you anyway at the end. So what I'd like to do for you is actually log into ChatGPT to show you how this works. So I'm going to flip my screen. And here's what I want you to see is I have ChatGPT opened. And if, for those of you that are already using it, I use a lot of extensions. I'm using keywords everywhere. I'm using AIPRM for ChatGPT. I have Google Sheets open and I also have Canva open. But to make it easy, I did log into ChatGPT somewhere else. So you don't have to see all of that. So now I have ChatGPT open. I have Canva open, and I also have Perplexity. In order to build the content that you want in either wh whichever one you're gonna use, um, just open them up and then you'll come up with your prompt. So I'm gonna use, I already have the prompt created. And for those of you that really wanna see this, here we go. And I don't even know if it sounds great, but write nine posts for social media targeting buyers that need to save for a down payment on a home with a hook with, with a, well, I'm not even gonna correct it, with a hook, title, a good call to action, um, the po and the post description. I'm not gonna even edit because it's gonna build it. Write nine posts in a table view with the first column as the number column. So we're gonna copy it. So I'm gonna show you how you could build this in either ChatGPT, Canva, for those of you that are paying for Canva, I upgraded to pay for ChatGPT, and then you also have this thing called perplexity.ai. So we're going to build it in all three. So here's ChatGPT. I'm in a new chat, and I'm going to simply paste it, Command V, Control V, and then I'll click the little green arrow, and here we go. I have never tried this one in perplexity. There you go. I have my nine posts already created. Then... I'll hop over to Canva where um, OpenAI is integrated. And it's this simple, just click on docs. And then once you are in docs, you're gonna create a new doc. And before you get excited, don't just copy, cut and paste. Click this plus sign and choose magic right. And then you're going to write your prompt, your question and click enter. And let's see if we get a table view. Didn't quite get the table view, but you still got content. Now let's try it in perplexity. My point in sharing this with you is you might get different content and you can actually keep asking the system to rebuild it and give you better information or rewrite it because you want more options. So here we go. Look at this. I have nine. Some of you are like, Carrie, why did you choose nine? Because on Instagram, I like my content to look clean so, because I'd actually created 10 posts and I was like, oh, that wasn't a great, great idea. So it's in column view and you get three. So you could do three, you could do six, you could do nine, you could create 12. Just go with how much work you really want to do. So maybe three is really enough. 
Now, once you do have your content, here's the next part. I'll highlight this and like, this is my favorite and I'm gonna copy it and I'll hop over to, let's go back over to Google Sheets. Now you can use numbers, you could use Microsoft Excel. And so I'll click on a new sheet and then we're just gonna paste my new spreadsheet. There it is, easy, 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 easy. And then, and now you don't even have to read this. You don't have to adjust it, you know, habit. I like to, you know, equally justify everything, but you don't have to. You can simply give it a title. And so for this one, I believe it was for, so I'll call this down payment content for social media. It doesn't even matter if you have a title. You just need to be able to download this into comma separated value. So once I click file and then I choose download and I'll download this as CSV, it's done. Then I can hop back over to Canva. And so we'll hop back over to Canva and then I'll choose create a design. Once you choose create design and I haven't picked one yet. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'll show you how easy this is. Let's type in Instagram reel. Like this, I used to work really hard. I actually create all the content for the agents in my office. Well, well actually Tally does one of our admins. I trained her to do it, but now we all work faster. So over here to the left, I would just choose a template. So let's go with real estate. May I'll, let's see what real estate tips gives me. Okay, you know, some of these are great and you will have to do some editing. So let's go with this one. Of course, you need to comply with license law. You need to comply with the code of ethics. In, in our state, the company logo cannot be smaller than the agent's name or, if, if, or the agent's team logo. So if I put my name on the marketing, I must put the company logo. So make sure you know your license law. The next thing I would do is, you know, I like to clean things up and I'm just gonna change colors, to company colors. And I might even put in the office phone number. Remember, I have five kids, three grandkids, and I might be closer to the baby boomer age. So I need to tell people what to do. So even though we're using artificial intelligence, I need to still tell people what to do. The next thing I might do is you can go over to the left and under apps, you're going to look for something called bulk create. So I'm going to turn it off to show you how you find it. So under apps, you'll scroll down to bulk create, and then you can enter the data manually or upload with comma separated value. So if I choose upload, there's my new download. So I'll upload it. And I can now see that I have one, two, three, four, five columns. I can choose to use all of them. I could choose to use three of them. I have one that has a number. So let's do that. What we're gonna do is before we actually merge this content, I'll come over to the left and let's choose text. And so I'm gonna add another text field here. We'll move this one up. I'll change this to a number sign and I'll just make it larger. No, I can't even bigger than that. And then, I now need to go back to bulk create because I wanna see what my options were, what those columns were. So here's my hook. And so I can see that it's a little bit long. So um, I'll, I'll start with the title. So I'm gonna change this to title and then I'm gonna shrink it just based on the fact that it has uh, many words. So we'll make this like size 30. Then I'm going to change this. I'll make this my call to action. I'll move us up this up. So you do have to do a little bit of work. You have to customize it so it looks the way you want. And we'll change this one to uh, I'm going to make this one the title. And then we're going to make this one the hook. And then let's see. 
This one's going to be the post description. You don't have to write all of that out. And then even though my title looks a little bit long, we'll shrink that a little bit and be prepared. You might still do a little bit of work. And then we'll make this one the CTA, call to action. Now I did adjust a little bit. I might even change some of the, uh, you know, my brand to my brand colors, totally up to you. And I don't need this video to be 19 seconds. I, what I've learned on social media is the shorter the video, whenever you create content for YouTube, Reels, Facebook, TikTok, if it gets consumed right away, it pushes you up the feed. So now that we've created and maybe you've changed the colors, Maybe you've gone and you've added your company logo. Hold down the control key if you don't want it to change your video. And we'll pretend like I'm done. Again, for the sake of time, we're going to merge this to show you what it gets. So if you go back over to your bulk create, um, you now need to add um, your data fields. So if I click on the number sign and you see these three dots, of course, you can right click my techie folks. I'll connect data, and so we'll uh, connect the number. We'll click on the hook, and then you can, again, you can right click. So we'll choose the hook. This is the title. Not giving me what I want. I don't know why it didn't give me what I want, but I think you get it. Post description, call to action. Oh, I know why. Let me help you. This square box does not connect with data. So we're gonna get rid of this box. We're gonna create a new element or text box and we'll call this one the title. I learned that the hard way. Three dots, connect the data, title, here we go. So now that you have, you know, all of your data fields set, hop back over to your bulk create, and then simply click continue. Are you ready? And then you just generate and you merge. So it took me probably less than six minutes to create all of the content. Will you make changes? Yes. So you might move things up and down. You're going to edit a little bit. You might stretch out some of your, some of the content. You can even choose not to use all of the content, but here's what I want you to see. So when I move this up a little bit and I go to the next one, again, I can edit this however I want. You don't want all of these to look exactly the same. So what would you do? You'd click on the video, hop back over to elements, and then choose, I'll type in modern living room. I like this one. Then I'll choose videos, and then I can continue to change all of the videos for all nine posts. I can come up here to the top. I can call this my um, down payment social media posts. And then on my mobile device, I can open up Canva. I can upload all of the content to Reels and I can schedule the post right in Instagram. And I'm done. So before we hop into q and I'll hop back over to my presentation for a moment. And I'm giving all of you this download. It is called 10 Ways to Use ChatGPT for Real Estate. And this is, this, is, this is the basic. Again, artificial intelligence is so much more than what I gave you. But if I could convince you to start using it today, just one thing, maybe it's social media. Maybe it's creating direct mail content because I use it for postcards. I, I use it for, to create content for social media. You could use the sky's the limit. Um, I give you some example prompts. 
and I give you some other tools you might want to look at. And then if you scan this QR code now, that download, I don't even ask you for your email. It is in Google Drive, just download. It. It's in Google Drive. And then once you do download it, all of those links, the links might not be clickable, but uh, the second to the last page, I'm giving you the video that helped me create this video. It's absolutely awful, but it'll take you through the process. And then I give you some other videos that I have over on YouTube. And, it, and I show you how to use InfoSparks. I show you how you can use Canva right. I show you how to use it on a mobile device. I show you how to use AI on a device versus Canva right. The true basics so you can get started. Okay. Any questions? Are we ready to hop into some Q&A? So Jeff, I made it really easy. Oh yeah. Simple, simple. Simple, simple. Good stuff. You and I could just sit and have a conversation. We we could have a conversation. There you go. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, you guys are good job. Um, early in your presentation, you used the word truth. When it comes to AI, who or how it determines what the truth is? And is artificial intelligence elegant enough to review the misinformation that gets repeated that almost becomes true? No, I don't I don't think the lang large language model, the the sort of the, the base underlying models are intelligent enough mm -hmm. to distinguish between the 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 fake news and the real news. It consumed everything. Uh, you know, what most people don't understand is these models weren't trained in a vacuum. They were trained with uh, hordes of humans, typically in third world countries, being paid very poor wages to tag this content and to identify what that content is. And so the quality of what's consumed and the quality of what you get out is contingent on these laborers who go through and tag all of this content. So it, it's not enough just to be able to have uh, content to consume. You have to have that content tagged in a way that it understands what that content is used for. So from a foundational standpoint, no, I don't believe the models um, can distinguish, which is the reason why you get the kinds of hallucination you get with ChatGPT if you're just running it in the open. When you use plugins like Carrie's using plugins to direct it to specific content or to specific ways of working, then you limit that data set to a data set. For example, there will be an MLS plugin. Bright or CRMLS or someone, MRED, somebody, somebody's going to make the decision. We're going to create a plugin for ChatGPT that gives people access to the MLS in some way, shape, or form or Zillow will do it, or Realty.com will do it, or the fill in the blank. Well, somebody's going to do it. The moment that happens and you limit the, the data and you're using the foundational model just as a conversational engine, it's what's helping me communicate back and forth. Then the data that comes out theoretically can be limited to the truth that sits inside of the source of truth. In this case, that would be the MLS. So it's a form of domain adaptation to limit the knowledge that it can pull from so that its answers are drawing from a unique data set. Thank you, Anybody else? Um, this is not a real estate related question, but uh, as GBT has become or on the new side of it, it's being written about every single day in New York Times, et cetera. Um, and there are uh, people out there warning about regulation, uh, very much saying that it needs to be written. I, I, I can't picture what that is or how that would happen. What regulation look like? 
Um, Carrie, I'll take a first stab at it. And maybe you'll, you'll the question I heard is what does regulation look like? Uh, you know, a slide that I skipped over in my presentation was a recommendation that I made to the NAR tech policy committee on how they should approach these language models and the ethical nature of how data is created. You know, listen, it, it's it's not going to shock you if I go to Mid Journey right now and I simply give it a simple prompt. Um, realtor standing in front of a house, I'm going to get I'm going to get thirty white guys standing in front of a house before I get my first female. Um, it's just, and even a minority, you won't even you will even not a minority, get minority. You, yeah, you have to, you have to get very 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 specific with this data. So there's a tremendous amount of bias that is sort of built into these models, not necessarily on purpose, but simply because the bias has existed for so long that it's just inherent in the data sets that are being used. So I think there is there are a couple of different models for how to how to address this. Some of it is in the data sets that are being used. Some of it is in how the data gets trained. And some of it is going to be on making certain that people understand that the content that's coming out is actually being produced by these models. I think there, I think all of this needs to come with a bit of a warning label. Um, I have been using uh, chat GPT in combination with a couple of other things to write new blog posts for, um, I, I write a, for years I've written on a, a website called stopchildslavery.com. Uh, chat GPT does a very good job of summarizing some of uh, the stuff that's coming into the news over a period of time. And at the bottom of every post, I put a little disclaimer. This was predominantly created using chat GPT. It was validated by a real human. It was fact checked in this way so that anybody reading it understands this is what was done to produce this content. Um, we're going to need a lot of that in the world so that we understand what is actually being produced by a human and what's not. I think it's important to care. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are uh, from an ethical I'm, standpoint. I'm going to say, I, I'm glad that policy is looking at it through NAR and I'm chair of data strategies. And so even the data scientists at NAR, are they're having the conversations around, you know, do we even allow our, you know, chat GPT or open AI into their data sets, or should they be building their own? And then yes, the disclaimers, even our state, um, I just, Marky Lemons and I just did a podcast on how we're using AI, and then they had legal on with us to have the conversation around if you were to go and just, you know, write an article, I mean, because there are attorneys that are using it and you're seeing it all on social media or in the news or even Reddit, where my kids get the news, Jeff, yeah, just, you know, that they're getting, people are getting sued because they're not fact checking. So th there is value in creating your own content because I still write my own content. I still write my own blog posts, but I'm just not the best writer. So the value to me is putting it in my own voice and correcting the grammar. So definitely, I would say to everyone, please make sure that if you are using artificial intelligence, disclose and then go do your own research outside of what it pulled. Because you know my and my, I say my twin and I because we do co talks on diversity, and she will put in the same prompt that I put in, and we get two different responses and we're finding that it is it is bias um and then i'll throw in you know information from our license law from the code of ethics just to validate and and it'll correct i think we're uh, going to be seeing here? a lot uh, i yeah i just want to follow up on that we're going to what this concept domain adaptation is is one you're going to hear a lot about it's a word you should probably keep in your brain it's really about saying i'm going to utilize so a foundational model would be open AI's GPT-4. That's a foundational model. That GPT is an implementation. It's an interface to that foundational model. Stability has a foundational model. Google has a foundational model. Meta has a foundational model. Amazon has a foundational model. Apple has a foundational model. These are the, the, these are the, the basis upon which these conversational engines work. That's trained on these large language data sets, which gives it its ability to create conversation. The domain adaptation is 
I'm going to limit this to a specific set of knowledge. I'm going to use the foundational model to, to create the conversational engine, but the data, the truth is going to be contained in a smaller subset of that data so that you know that when you're interacting with it, you're getting, you're, you're getting truth. The only data that it can provide you is from that smaller subset of data. Sorry, I want to clarify that. Okay, Sarah. Um, hi, uh, this this is for Jeff. You mentioned the Lori app for this iPhone. I have an Android. Android. Is there something comparable to the Lori app on an Android iPhone? No idea. I pay no attention to Android whatsoever. Oh, sorry. So discriminated against Android. There's too much. I would say go Google it. Google it. I'm an I am exactly. an Android user with an iPhone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so I I always go and, and compare because yeah, I would go just go check to see because the, the, the reason why many of us have iPhones in tech is because in, information or apps and tools are built on that platform first and then Android gets it second. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I have a Windows phone with my children. And I'm still married to my husband that uses a <laughs> Don't know how. I, I have a question. Uh, maybe more on the legal side, but in terms of using uh, open content and having you know, it give you some information you want to check and you want to incorporate it into something you're going to be there. Then you put your own content. Say uh, where, where, uh, where you did before with, with the listing and showing information. How do we, one is, how do we protect our content? Make sure that somebody else to just uh, honor with it and lose it. Because once it's out there, it's digital. Anybody can take it and massage it and do what they want to do. And uh, I know that what you just said about back checking to make sure that what we're getting back from the chat is good information, but how do we protect ourselves from somebody saying, hey, wait a minute, you use my information? Uh, listen, I've, I've got two comments on that. One, you, the moment you put something out into the world, you, you become AI's free data worker. You know, the, the, depending on the license agreement with the model that you're using, even the questions you're feeding into these sites, it, the corrections you're making, the reclassification that you're asking it to do becomes training data. And I don't think there is a way to protect anything that's sitting on the open web from being ingested by AI and reutilized. I, I don't, I, I don't. I don't see how it's even possible. My solution is going to be real basic. Is I have uh, Google alerts for my company my my name. So if someone uses anything that I create, I at least know about it. If someone uses, I mean, it's it's Google alerts. I know right now that's just very basic. And I'm a boutique brokerage. So I just want to know what's happening or if something, an agent does something they shouldn't. So I know that sounds basic, but at least it's a start. One of my favorite movies, I will spend. And one of the keys to that movie is to figure out the proper question to ask the computer. So my question to you is how do we figure out the right prompt, proper questions to ask these people? No, I, I'm going to let you answer that, Gary. I, I've gotten very, very good at prompting chat GPT and mid journey and some of these, these other things. I don't know whether it, I've just gotten lucky or whether I'm, you know, well, I don't, I don't know what, I don't, I don't know what my excuse is for getting better results than most people, but there is an art to prompt writing. There is a skill. It, I think it's a, the skill is asking the right questions. It's almost like having a conversation with you know, my husband versus my kids or someone that's tech savvy or non-tech savvy. And a lot of reasons why I probably could train almost any agent because I know how to, to get it down to the level they understand. So I will, my challenge for you would be is to just ask it to do what you want. And then when it doesn't give you what you want, 
think ask about question. It, it's just ask ask the question differently because I kept asking it to build um, a a spreadsheet. It was like what? <laughs> and then um, it's I was like okay in a column view, and it did it. And then I'm like oh in a table view. So when I got when I was able to figure out the right prompt or question, then I'll, I'll tell you what I do is I actually have a Canva doc or an Evernote created, and I have all of these prompts that I've created so I can share them with people because it 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 gets smarter, it gets easier. You're just gonna have to get in there and and you know get up about an hour earlier a day and then go work out first and then come back and play with GPT. Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, you know, the very first question uh, relative to regulation, it's very, very difficult or will be very, very difficult for the real estate industry to play in the regulation space if it hasn't played inside of the technology first. You, you really have to understand truly what's possible so that you can understand what needs limited and what doesn't need limited. How how you want it to work, how you want your data to work inside of it. What are the benefits that you want to accrue from all of this? Those are the kinds of questions that I, I think can only come after you've had a chance to play inside of the technology for yourself. You have to understand what the outer boundaries are before you start pulling back in to a level that makes sense from a compliance standpoint. Because even tech companies, go ahead. I, I was just saying you have one more comment. Yeah, there's comment. I'm not sure I, I heard that question properly. Can somebody repeat that one for me? Do you have any, any, any last thing to uh, say before we wrap it up? So do we have anything we want to share to wrap it up? Uh -huh. Listen, I I I, I want to I want to tell you to just go play. We learn best when we're in play mode. We we that's how we learn as kids. That's how you're going to learn best as an adult. Try not to take it too seriously at first. Don't make your first project something really, really important to you where you're going to get frustrated by the output that comes from it and just go play. Um, and then make your own decision about how you want to use it. This is a lot like social media. Not, not all social media is for everyone. Um, just, just because everybody else is on, you know, mid journey, TikTok or mid journey doesn't mean you need to be on it. But it's not a bad thing to go and play a little bit and just just let yourself be a child for a bit. Thank you. Let's see, Tony. Before Tony now wraps it up, is Tony Danza? Tony, you want to say a few words before you wrap it up? President Tony Danza wants to say a few things. Thanks, Ray. That was a great program. Um, actually, I'm not sure if you mentioned about RPAP. Anthony, did you want to say something about RPAP? Cody, uh, Chair RPAC, uh, NAR, the committee, and uh, Hudson Gateway. I wish we could 